Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it, it, it's, it's remarkable, certainly, to be up on this panel. I, I, I can attest to the fact that these are real stories. And as a certified athletic trainer myself, I know that the, that the way that we've treated concussions over the last 30 years of my career is much different. So to hear Ross talk about the early days, I mean, that, that's, that's real because that's what we had. That was our knowledge base at that time. That knowledge base has trained, changed tremendously. And uh, a lot of my colleagues throughout the United States and the world that are doing concussion research, it's really a testament to, to them. So the standards in which we treat athletes today is much different than it was years ago. Um, it's unfortunate that these athletes, when they play the game, they take a risk, and that risk is injury. And concussion is part of that. And, uh, Fortunately now, because of the media attention in the United States especially, it's not as, as grand in the world, but there's brought that focus on people who are on the front lines, such as certified athletic trainers, uh, physicians who deal with these. And I can tell you that we really have been advocating for a much more conservative approach now in dealing with these concussions. And I think that that's a good thing. Unfortunately, they have to suffer those consequences because perhaps along the way they may not have been treated the right way. But again, I'll sit up here today and advocate for, for certified athletic trainers. I think that that's, that's, that's key. I'm an educator myself. I know what my students, I know what the, student, the, the training that my students get. And so uh, that, that's, that's a good first step. And that might not always be a resource available to you but that's certainly a good first step. Uh, coach Samson talked about the fact of educating coaches. Well, in those situations where there's not a certified athletic trainer, coaches are on the front lines. Coaches, referees, parents, they're closest to the student athletes that get hurt. And just drawing attention to it. So the advocates here, that's important because it's gonna draw attention to the fact that these athletes need to be seen. We are much more conservative with, with concussions today than we were, you know, just, five years ago. And that's a good thing as we move forward. In terms of my own research, I've been doing this for about 18 years uh, in terms of the concussion research in soccer. It goes back to my days at the University of Florida, worked with the women's soccer team. Had a fortunate opportunity there to, to work with Abby and to work with uh, Heather Mitz, who were on the national team. And uh, that work's continued today in terms of some of the work that we do with, with Heather. We actually track headers in every practice, every game at the University of Delaware. And we have data from our student athletes from the beginning of the year to the end of the year to the end of their career. And I can tell you today that, that despite what the media might say, <coughs> heading the soccer ball if done correctly is not, not the problem. It's not the problem. The act of heading does produce concussions. These guys are living proof of the fact that, you know, sometimes you go up to head a ball and you get hit, hit with an elbow, hit with another head, but the, the, the act of heading traditionally has not caused those, those concussions. There will be athletes running down the field, they get hit, hit with an errant ball, go off their head, they, they produce a concussion because they weren't expecting it. So, you know, I think that, that that's a good thing, you know, to protect the sport because heading is such an important and integral part of the sport is, is a good thing. And our data points to the fact that we've never, we're not seeing detriment there, and that's a good thing. But concussions do occur due to the act of heading, without question. And as uh, Coach Sampson said, too, you know, I, I'm an advocate that, that young kids don't need to be heading in soccer. You know, I think that maybe 12, 13, 14, when their neck muscles get strong enough, then they can begin to, to, to have the ball. But let's face it, even in the young kids' game, the ball is not in the air that much. It really begins to get in the air a lot, you know, 14, 15 years old. And, and unfortunately, the concussions occur, because again, that's a risk that you take playing the sport. But the concussions aren't occur occurring specifically by you going ahead of the ball. At least our, our short-term data shows that. I can't speak to the fact of what happens to these student athletes when they're 20, 20 years after they've given up their career. Only time will tell to see what's, what's happening. I venture to guess that it's a little bit different than what you're seeing with football because the, the forces are much greater. 
but again, I, I can't say that with any uh, exact proof because we're just not at that point. But research is evolving, and we will get better. Just like we've gotten better with the way we treat, we're, we're understanding what, what's happening in, in the sport and with the skill of soccer heading as well. So. <clears throat> Uh, thanks very much. You know, 20 years ago, uh, as a young athlete, well, 40 years ago as a young athlete, never wore a heart monitor. I don't work out without ever having a heart monitor, which measures where my heart rate is. Uh, I see the day where we change the paradigm of knowledge that we were ahead of.